Welcome. If you're just joining us, we're studying the Gospel according to John. And we come today to chapter 3 and verse 22. My name is Keith Mosier. I'm one of the instructors at the Memphis School of Preaching. And I've been preaching, or trying to preach, I guess you should call it, now for 58 years, and have been at the School of Preaching for about 40, a little over 45, almost 45 years, excuse me. My 45th year will end on October 1st. It's a privilege to teach there, but it's because every day we study the Bible. Uh, we study God's Word, and it's such a rich thing. And each time I go over a text, and some of the texts that I've taught for years, some new and some old, but I think I've taught every book of the Bible at one time or another at Memphis School Preaching. And certainly it's the case that the Gospel according to John is a much needed study in today's world of the deity of the one that we call Jesus, God in the flesh. In fact, John wrote this book to prove that. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written. The ones in this text are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That is, under his authority. And so we have a great study about the deity of Christ. And John chooses to, to use some discourses Jesus had with individuals or groups. John, the apostle, was told by the Holy Spirit to choose seven miracles, all of which covered every aspect of the control that God would have over his universe, and so on. And so we have here a great study to show us this is not just a man as Nicodemus said that we know there are a man sent from God but this is deity in the flesh he was given the name Jesus because he was born of the virgin Matthew 1 18 through 25 but he was not called Jesus in eternity in eternity he was the word that is the Logos, the reason, the mover, the prime one who executed the plan of the Godhead. So he's not eternally the Son. He did not become the Son of God until he was begotten of the Virgin by the Holy Spirit. And so we have John's assurance. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, same being in the flesh, but he had a name on earth, Jesus. We know him by that name today. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Joseph, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And isn't it interesting that that's what the word Jesus means? Savior, Jesus, Joshua, Yahshua, that kind of thing. Jesus, Savior. And oh, how we love him for coming to save us. Otherwise, we're ships without an anchor. We can't get into the shore of heaven because the lighthouse isn't there if he didn't come. And he is the light to keep us from the rocks of sin. And where would I be without that lighthouse? Where would this ship be, the song says, without the Christ? Nicodemus was privileged to meet Jesus face to face, one on one. And yet he was confused about what Jesus told him. You must be born again. And my friend, that's the only way you can believe on Jesus is to be born again. Because the one who said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, is the same one who said to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believing on Jesus requires a new birth. And Jesus himself said so. And so Jesus came to deny faith-only advocates their position. 
and why any human being would deny the need of baptism is beyond me. It's commanded. You don't have to take the position that you don't need to do everything Jesus commanded to go to heaven. And yet he said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. Well, what's his will? You be baptized in water according to the instructions of the Holy Spirit. And after Jesus got through with that conversation with Nicodemus, the Bible says that he came into the land of Judea. So he was in Galilee when he was talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus came a long way to see him then. And there he tarried with them and baptized. Well, Jesus did not do any physical baptizing. Verse 2 of chapter 4. His apostles did it. There may be a reason for that about of a peer group pressure. Well, Jesus baptized me. It must not be, uh, your baptism must not be that good. But so the ones doing the actual physical baptizing were the disciples. It is virtually the case in reality that it does not matter who baptizes you. If it did matter who did it, then my, your salvation and mine would have depended on two people. That the one who did it was the right one and faithful and so on. But that isn't the case. The physical act of baptism can be done by anybody anytime. What is necessary is that the person's being baptized, must, the person being baptized must understand from his mind, he must know why he's being baptized. He will obey from the heart a pattern of teaching delivered to him. He will obey the death, burial, and resurrection, and he'll understand, when I come up out of that watery grave, God's going to take away my sins. That's important. He has to understand that. Otherwise, you just have a ritual of baptism. And some teach that as ritualistic. Well, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, they say, but you need to be baptized to get into our denomination. Well, logically, that means that to get into that denomination takes more effort than to get into heaven. Would that make that denomination better than heaven? They must think so, because they haven't done it in denominations' way. The denominations have not done it God's way yet. That's why they're denominations and not in the church. When our brethren went into Poland years ago and fed those folks, the Polish government, which was more communistic than anything else, authorized, legalized the Church of Christ in Poland. And the only other denomination that was authorized legally was the Catholic Church. So when denominational preachers would get, find their way into Poland finally, they would be told they'd have to worship with the Church of Christ. Well, we're not of that group. Well, aren't you all worshiping the same God in the way that God wants you to worship? The Polish government, very left-wing, understood about unity better than those denominational preachers did. If we're all serving the same God, we should all be in the same church. And there's only one church. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. There's one body. Not many, one. So after explaining to Nicodemus, Jesus moved back south to Judea, where John also was baptizing. That's Jesus' cousin, not yet in prison, still out there baptizing folks. Why was he baptizing Enoch near Salem? Because there's much water there. I preached a gospel meeting one time for an Enon Church of Christ. And hopefully some came to be baptized. I don't remember if they did in that meeting particularly. But here is John out immersing folks. And we learned 
from Mark 1 that he was doing that in order for them to have their sins remitted, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He was calling Jews back to the law of Moses and baptizing them to get them ready to be set in the kingdom, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, to be set in the kingdom so that they would be there when the church started and there would be a group, the, the, the initial seed of the church on the day of Pentecost. That's why our Bible say that after those folks were baptized, they were added unto them, that group that John and Jesus got ready, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so there was a group here being prepared for the coming of the Church of Christ. And there are some major differences between what John and Jesus were teaching and what is taught now in terms of baptism. John was telling the people, and that would mean that Jesus was too. And incidentally, it says Jesus' people were baptizing more than John was. So people came out to hear Jesus for a far longer time than they did John. John, you remember, was arrested and put in prison and beheaded. But John's baptism was not in the name of Christ. They didn't do this according to the New Testament authority of Christ, which was given him at, after his resurrection, not before. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. It certainly wasn't done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. How was it done? It was preparatory. Our baptism today under the New Testament system is fixed. We're not getting prepared in that sense. And those who were baptized by John and Jesus' disciples were taught that to believe on the Christ to come and repent because the kingdom of heaven was near. Acts 19, 1 through 6. There was no promise of the church with John's baptism and the baptism of Jesus. This particular teaching was limited to the Jews. It was not done for the Gentiles before the time that the church started. And these people confessed their sins. And that's an important point for all of us who live on this side of the cross, who can look back at Calvary, who are almost over 2,000 years removed from that terrible event. When we look back, we don't do what they did when it comes to confession. Before we are baptized, we do not confess our sins. We're not asked to confess our sins before baptism. We're asked to confess that He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then God takes care of our sins and performs an operation of removing them in the watery grave of baptism. Not because the water does it, but because God does it. Colossians 2, 12 through 14. And so here is a statement. John was not yet cast into prison. He's out doing the work that God sent him to do. And he's in Enon near Salem. There's enough water there to immerse people. Got to have enough water to baptize. That good and great gospel preacher, college professor, teacher of the Bible, J.W. McGarvey, produced a geographical study of Palestine. That book is known as Lands of the Bible. And in that book, he talks about all of the streams and pools of water in this area of Enon near Salem. And so we're assured that there's much water there. And I noticed something else. Notice that the people came and were baptized. They came to John. John didn't go out and get them. They came to him. They had to recognize those who were baptized. That John was a, a prophet. Look at how he's dressed, camel hair coat. Look at what he's eating, locusts and wild honey. He's acting like a prophet. 
and we haven't had a prophet among us for 400 years. Amos told us there'd be a dearth 400 years. Well, there's been. Now here comes John. The voice crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his way straight. Isaiah 40, verse 1. And John is telling the people, here's the Son of God. I must decrease. He must decrease. And so some began to question John's disciples. Who were questioning them? Some other Jews. What were they asking about? Purifying. You're teaching that kind of baptism in that kind of water for the remission of sins? But we have to have a certain kind of water. to purify. Uh, it has to be the water that the priest prepares. And he has to get it in a special place from the laver outside the temple. Well, it is the case that they had a ceremony connected to their purifying. John has repentance connected to his. A bull, an obedience from the heart, not just going through it because of the ceremony. And I noticed something else, and I kind of went by it when we first read it to come back to it right here. The people came to John. He didn't take the water to them because he needed more water than just enough to sprinkle it on them or pour it on them. So the Holy Spirit says he had to come out, they had to come out there because there's much water there. And now John is quite glad to do this kind of work. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, that one you called the Lamb of God. Behold, the same baptism, and all come to him. There's folks coming out there to Jesus. Now, John, what do you say to that? John said, Heaven told them to do this. A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. That's why he's doing it. He's charged by heaven to do it. This is heaven's message. For yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, same group who had questioned him before, but that I am sent before him. John is thrilled that his cousin, the Savior of the world, has now begun his work. It looks to me like those who came to G John were trying to get him at cross purposes with his own half co his own half cousin. They're not going to do that with John because he knows who it is that's out there. He knows from whence he came. And then he tells them something very, he said, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. I'm not the bridegroom. The bride, of course, is Jesus' church, but the friend of the bridegroom, that's all I am. I'm just his friend. And so, which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. I'm so happy he's out there doing what you said. I wonder if that startled those fellows. And were they taken back by the fact that John said, I'm not unhappy he's out there preaching. No, I'm full of rejoicing. Because I must decrease. He must increase. He's the one. I'm not. He's above everything. Even he's above me, John said. Paul wrote that in all things Christ must have the preeminence. But he went a little further right after that statement to add a very important thought for us concerning our master, the 
Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus. The one who has all authority in heaven and earth, Jesus. And when he, after he got through saying that in all things he might have the preeminence, he wrote, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Colossians 1, 19. And Paul thought that if Paul thought that was important, the Holy Spirit told him to repeat it. It was really important. Look at Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is the fullness of God. All the space between me and God is taken up by him. But John said the very fact that he's here also fills me with joy. He must increase, but I must decrease. John says, I don't know what you're driving at, you Jews, but I'm just thrilled that my cousin's doing what he came to do. And John adds this, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. I'm of the earth, John said. He that cometh from heaven is above all. John knew him. What a witness. His own cousin. This is God in the flesh, folks. That's the Lamb of God. Why do you think I'd be disappointed that he's out of your preaching? And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. He's telling you what heaven's message is. And no man received this testimony. And now John just point blank says, you need to listen to him because you're not doing it right now. They were not listening to Jesus. And so the power that Jesus had from heaven wasn't being heeded. He that receiveth his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. The person who believes what Jesus teaches is sealed spiritually in the sense that he is convinced that this Christ is the one to whom he should listen. He's convinced that this one is God in the flesh. He's convinced that God is true. My friend, this is the truth of God, the Bible, not this particular one. But the message in here is God's Word. It's truth. And there's nothing in this book anywhere about a Baptist church or a Lutheran church or a Presbyterian church or a Seventh-day Adventist church or a Catholic church. Nothing. Someone has estimated over 40,000 groupings calling themselves Christian, but 39,999 of them are not mentioned in this book. Is God true? On one occasion, and we'll read about it when we get to the sixth chapter of John, the one we call the sixth chapter, of course, we... Somebody gave that name to it. It's not in the original writing. But in that sixth chapter, we're going to read about a time when Jesus told the crowds, if you don't partake of me completely, you'll not be my disciples. They said, this is a hard saying, and walked away. And Peter said something interesting, because Jesus turned and said to the apostles, will you also go away? Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, 66. There's no place to go other than to you. Yet, men today go to their creed books, their so-called pastors, their priests, thinking they're getting the truth. 
when in fact they're getting nothing but error from those folks. You want to get the truth, you're going to have to go to this. The New Testament message combined with the principles of the Old Testament teaching, you'll find the truth. And if you're looking for salvation, look in the New Testament, not the Old. But for 2,000 years, men have corrupted this text. They're still trying to corrupt it. They've come out with Bibles in the last 150 years that have corruption in them. And so you can walk into a church building with the devil's message right in something you call the New Testament. One of these translations is so bad that you can't even find the plan of salvation in it. And yet it claims to be a Bible. So man has figured out many, many ways, led by Satan, of course, to go away from truth. And one of the most popular sayings among so-called Christians today, wherever they're living, and if I could say it in 500 languages, I would. I can only say it in English. I know what the Bible says. But... Is God true or not, my friend? Because you have no other message from Him than this New Testament, coupled with the Old. There's no other Bible. This is it. If this is not God's Word, I might as well go home anyway. I don't need to be teaching. But it is God's Word. But that creed book, that manual, that church statement, that we are greater than the Bible because we gave the world the Bible. That's the Catholic Church position. Is not true. The Bible, the seed, the Word of God, gave the church to the world. Luke 8, 11, Ephesians 5, 26. Not the other way around. And the church that gave this Bible to the world is the Church of Christ that started in A.D. 30, on the day of Pentecost, in Jerusalem, when the Holy Spirit gave the gift of speaking in tongues and other miracles to the apostles who taught those people that day to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. And when they taught those people that day, those who obeyed, 3,000 of them, were added to the Church of Christ, Acts 2.47. And there was no one there who could tell them about any other church because there wasn't any other one. That's the one I preach, the one that where Peter was that day, the one where Andrew was that day, the one where Matthew was that day. That church is not a denomination. That's the truth of God. And that's the testimony of the Master. I am going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not stop me. Matthew 16. 18. He that have received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. And then John adds, and he wasn't shortchanged with those words. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure. The Holy Spirit's Complete message from God was known to the Christ. He taught it. The Holy Spirit taught the same thing that Jesus taught His apostles. John 14, 26, 15, 26, 16, 12, and 13, and 14. And so we have a message that's complete. The apostle Peter would later write, God hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, 3. If I want to know how to live the Christian life, if I want to know how to be godly, I don't need a thing other than the New Testament of Jesus Christ, coupled with the principles of the Old Testament, Romans 15, 4. Now, as John ends that discussion of John and Jesus teaching and baptizing for the remission of sins to get the kingdom, some folks together to start, he writes this, The Father loveth the Son. That ETH on the end of that word tells me that the King James translators believe this to be a present active indicative 
Greek word, verb, and it is. So it's a progressive or constant movement. He, the, the Father, keeps on loving the Son, doesn't stop, and has, has given, past tense, all things into His hand. For he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. How do I believe on Him? I'm born again. And he that believeth not, it's of great interest to note something here. The American Standard Version of 1901, where about 101 translators worked to produce, they started out 20 years earlier with the English Revised, but they, the two committees from America and England didn't get along very well. So because of copyright laws, 20 years later, these American translators got together to produce the American Standard Reversion. Great text, quite loyal to the text, Greek text they were using, which was a text that differed in the New Testament from the Textus Receptus, which was one of Erasmus' editions of his Greek Testament. And what was available to the American Standard Translators was were two earlier manuscripts in large letters called unseals, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. King James Translators did not have that. So the differences in the American Standard New Testament and the King James Trans New Testament are accounted for by the fact that the American Translator, Standard Translator used a different Greek text from the one available in 1611. The Old Testament texts were taken from the same works, the Hebrew Bible, not the Greek translation, but the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. So they are very similar. The American Standard did update some of the English words, such as unicorn, so on. But here, in the American Standard Version, 1901, we have this reading. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that obeyeth not the Son hath not, did not see life. Those translators understood the Greek to be teaching something that belief and obedience are equivalent. So if you go around saying, I believe on the Son, I'm going to ask you, when did you obey Him in baptism? Because if you don't obey that command, you didn't obey Him. If you don't keep one command, you might as well not keep any of them. And so we have a sentence here that the Father loves the Son, gave all things under His authority, and he that believeth on the Son, if you do what He says to do, you have life. But if you don't obey Him, you'll not see life. You see, Nicodemus, except you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. You can't see life except, except you obey, you can't go to heaven. Hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments, 1 John 2, 3. And this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous, 1 John 5, 3. In this third chapter, there is huge evidence of the deity of Christ. Even a Pharisee recognized that He's a man, but He came from God. Quite an interesting witness to Jesus' deity. But John said, He's the one. Told the Jews that. He's the one, and you better obey Him because He has all the truth. Is He deity, my friend? Yes. Have you obeyed Him? There's the question. Have you repented? Have you made the decision of faith? Have you confessed? Have you made the de declaration of faith? Have you been baptized? Have you made the demonstration of faith? With all that decision, that declaration, and that demonstration, you could be saved. Because he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Whatever is not of faith, puts us into a bad place, my friend. 
And so if someone says, are you saved by faith? Yes. And then I would ask him, where is that faith located? Do you not know that we're all the children of God by faith? All right, Paul, tell me where that gospel is located, that system of faith in Christ Jesus. All right, if that faith is located in Christ, how do I faith into Christ? You can't, Keith. Do you not know that so many of us have, were baptized into Christ, were put on Christ? Galatians 3.27. You see, 26, faith in Christ, is followed by baptism into Christ. If you're walking around saying, my faith is in Christ, I would ask you when you were baptized. Because just thinking it up here is not faith in the Bible sense. Faith has to believe. Faith has to declare. Faith has to demonstrate. Or there's no faith. And faith demonstrated puts us into Christ where the faith is that justifies us. So the next time you hear someone say, I have faith in Christ, ask him how he got there. We go back now, or go ahead now, to a, another conversation. Chapter 3, he was talking to Nicodemus. Then John inserted the cousin of Jesus, John the baptizer, as a witness to his, the deity of his cousin. Now we're going to meet a Gentile woman, maybe, or maybe a Samaritan who claimed to be a Jew, Probably so, since she was told where to worship. But the Samaritans were hated by the Jews because they were not practicing full Judaism. And this woman is living in Galilee. So he left Nicodemus, Jesus did, and went into Judea from Galilee. Now he's baptizing, or his disciples are, many folks, and they leave Judea and go back into Galilee. Not told why. But it says he must needs go through Samaria. Well, I could speculate about that. I could ask the question, did he know that that woman was there and he wanted to talk to her? He would have known that. He would have known that she would become a great illustration on how the master teacher approached her and told her what to do to find living water. But in actuality, I'm just guessing. It makes sense to me that he knew she was there, so he must needs go through Samaria. I do know that the Jews did not want to go through that area. That I do know. I know there was no material necessity to go through Samaria. Nothing there he needed materially. But a strict Jew would never have gone through here. A Pharisee would have avoided it. I did know from looking at the map that, he, that traveling through Samaria would be quicker to go to Galilee than the way he would go if he went around it. But they remained in Sychar two days before he went there. Chapter 4, verse 40. Look over there at 440. So when the marriage were coming and they be, he saw them, they would tear them, and he abode there two days. So that's not a speedier journey. No, I can't guess that, although I'm not so possible ever. Why go through Samaria? His mission is to seek and save the lost. <laughs> and so he never withheld his power from the willing. And maybe he knew she would be willing. 
Well, he comes to Sychar, verse 5 of our text, and he meets a woman. And he meets her in the heat of the day. He's tired with walking that far. And he sits on the well. Only one in the area, I guess. And it's about noon, sixth hour. Heat of the day. We know from where this place is located that even in their wintertime, it's hot on these days, especially at noon. And here comes a woman. I think this well is Jacob's well. Genesis 33, 18 through 20. Genesis 49, 21 and 22. And Deuteronomy 33, 28 and 29. Jacob's well was near Shechem, which would be near Sychar. If you went there today to visit Jacob's well, they would call it El Ascar. And Jacob's well being near Shechem, Sychar is a kind of suburb of Shechem. And the town over there, Shechem, is called Nablu, Nablus today, N-A-B-L-O-U-S. So we know the area. But something comes through in verse 6 that's important to us. We're studying about the fact this is God in the flesh, but we know now that His flesh got tired. Here's the human part that sits down at the well. He's truly in a body, but he's God in that body. And the woman comes, and he speaks to her. Oh, that would be a no-no for a strict Jew. We don't talk to the Samaritan woman, and we don't talk to a woman in public. But a Samaritan? Oh, Jesus. What are you doing? He came to seek and save the lost. He said, give me to drink. He starts with her mission. She came to draw water. Saw what she was doing? Started right there. He started where she was. That's how we teach people, you see. You start where they are. Were I to ask you, will the majority go to heaven? What would your answer be? According to Matthew 7, 14, the answer would have to be no. But it really doesn't matter how that question is answered if I start where you are. Will the majority go to heaven? You say no. Oh, would you like to confirm that answer with the Bible? Well, yes. Well, do you have tonight or tomorrow night open for a study? Well, tomorrow night. Do you have 6.30 or 7 o'clock open for a study? Well, 7 would be better. Well, may I, I'll be coming by your house then at 7. You like coffee? Well, yeah. Well, could you put some on? I like to drink coffee while I'm studying. Oh, that'd be great. All right, I'll see you tomorrow night at 7. I got to study. He started where she was. He started from something very ordinary. You like coffee? Water. He's by himself. His disciples had gone into Sychar to buy some food. And she's shocked that he speaks to her. She knows that's not the custom of most Jews or any Jew. So he, and she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We need to know who these Samaritans were. And in order to find out, we need to go back to the book of Nehemiah and the very last chapter. 
And we need to read about a fellow who was a nephew to Sanballat. And this fellow was a thorn in the side of those trying to restore Jerusalem and her walls. And in this chapter 13 of Nehemiah, we, we read about this son of Joida, who is the son of Eliashib, the high priest, who was son-in-law to Sanballat the Hornite. This fellow, verse 28, chapter 13 of, of Nehemiah, is not named in the Bible text. But he's of the priestly family. We know that. Who married a Horonite. But did not put her away. Which was being God's command for priests. Not to marry foreign women, strange women. Well, I was, Nehemiah says, I chased him away from me. Josephus, interestingly, tells us who this is. He even names him Manasseh, not the king of Judah, a different Manasseh, son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. When Nehemiah chased him away, Manasseh did an interesting thing. He got a copy of the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. He got a copy of the Holy Instructions, Genesis through Deuteronomy. But he did not take with him any of the prophetic books. We're all the way up in age, about 500 B.C. Four something B.C., maybe 480 B.C. We're getting closer and closer to the time of Christ. The Babylonian captivity is over. And this fellow has a lot of Bible books that he could have taken with him. He didn't. Reason? In the other books, it, it is mentioned that they must worship in Jerusalem at the temple. So he wants to start his own sect. And he did. And he established a worship place on Mount Gerizim. And he taught people to worship God there. That Samaritan did. And so you have the background of her statement that her, their fathers taught them to worship in this mountain. She's a Samaritan. And he takes her from the water to the living water. And, he, and when she said, you're a Jew, are you talking to me? You don't, you're not supposed to have dealings with us, are you? He said, if you knew the gift of God, he's the gift of God. And who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, if you knew who I am. <laughs> she sees a man, tired, sitting at the well, feet probably dusty, all by himself, talking to her. That's all she sees. But if you knew who I really am, my friend, do you know who he really is? Lady, you would have said to him, give me to drink. And had you said that to me, I would have given you living water. Wow. The woman said to him, You don't have a bucket. You have nothing to get water out of the well. Well, how are you going to draw water and give it to me? This well's deep. Where are you going to get living water? Is that on sale down at the local store? Oh, she is so confused. She doesn't know she's talking to deity. It won't take a whole lot to convince her as we read further into the text, but she doesn't know who he is at this moment. 
She's shocked that he's talking to her. He keeps leading her, though, and he tells her, you're talking to divine grace. You're talking to the gift of God, the gift of God that bring us salvation, the grace of God that bring us salvation has appeared to all men, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Samaritan. He's come for everybody. Titus 2, 11 and 12. And grace is a teacher, not some kind of a mysterious thing floating around out here to fall on people like stardust. Grace is a teacher, and it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2, 12. She's hearing the grace of God talk to her. Powerful. Changed her life. You tell me who you are. Well, I don't know how you're going to get this living water. Jacob made this well in that little place near Sychar and Shechem and in Samaria. And Jacob used it, and his children and his cattle. He takes her away now to the higher source of water. And he said, Whosoever drinketh of this water that I'm talking to you concerning shall never thirst. But the water you have will cause you to thirst again. How are you going to get water out of that well? Well, you drink of that water, you're going to get thirsty again. It's not living water. So he's trying to help her see, I'm not talking about that water. I'm talking about living water. That idea that once you drink that water, you'll get thirsty again is important for us. If we start going by the world and the way the world does something, we're never going to be satisfied. The first time I ever saw a TV set, it was about that big around. I think it was about seven inches, maybe nine. It was in a store, and I saw wrestling on that TV. Not wrestling, wrestling. They were really wrestling. But people did not remain satisfied with that event. It had to get more and more obscene, more and more a show, more and more loud, and so on. Because when you come to the world's well, you're never satisfied with what you find. It has to get bigger and better and louder and noisier, more obscene, and so on. He's telling her, if you're thinking materialistically, you're going to get thirsty again. However, whosoever, again, anyone, drinketh of my of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Powerful. And this water is a message. A message from the grace of God that brought salvation, teaching us to do some things to deny ungodliness and worldly lust which war against the soul and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's the water of life. When she heard that. <laughs> and I don't know how close she is to hearing the, seeing the truth for fully, but she says, give me this water so I won't have to come back to this well. She doesn't quite have it yet. I neither can Jesus says there. I tell you what, lady, go call your husband and come hither. 
I'll tell you how we can find that water. You need to repent. Go get your husband. Oh, well, um, 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 I have no husband. That's right, lady. You're living with somebody, but you don't have a husband. I as well said I have no husband. Thou hast had five husbands legally, but not scripturally. And the him whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou the truth. It's possible to be legally married, but not married correctly in God's sight. And if my mate has died, I can remarry. If I've never been married before, or he hasn't, or she hasn't, I can be married. But I cannot marry someone who has a living male husband or a living female wife. Because if the fact that it's against God's law. And I say unto you, that whosoever puts away his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, keeps on committing adultery. And whoso marries her that is put away, commits adultery. Lady, you said, well, you don't have a husband. And then she takes a step further in her learning. I see that you're a prophet. And she will run into the town and tell everybody, I met Messiah. Now her thinking has really progressed. And he told me everything I've ever done. Well, <laughs> and she said, well, if that's the case, if you're Messiah, you'll tell me all the things I've done. And Jesus says, I'm the one talking to you right now. You're a Samaritan. You were taught to worship on Gerizim. Wrong place. I'm a Jew and salvation comes through the Jews. I'm the one. But the true worshiper won't worship on this mountain anymore. The true worshiper will worship in spirit and truth wherever he is. So not only will we stop that worship on that mountain, we're going to stop worship in the temple as a requirement. And all of the world is going to worship in spirit and truth. She got so excited that when she went home, she said, Come see a man who taught me all things that I ever did. Well, I don't know about that, but I'm glad she's excited. And when we come back next time, we're going to pay some close attention, if God is willing, to verses 21 and following of John chapter 4 as he met with this woman of Sychar and took her from a high, a low concept of him to a higher, we too were taken to a high concept of the Master. That's John's purpose in the Gospel according to him.